Good morning, New Beginnings. It's me, Pastor Danish House. Today is Monday, October 31st, 2022. Thank you so much for joining me for this daily update and devotional video. I'm glad you decided to make me part of your life today, and I'm delighted that you are part of my life as well. Well, today is Halloween, uh, and probably a lot of trick-or-treaters coming by your house tonight. Um, and maybe you're surprised to see me uh, on a daily devotional video. I, I said yesterday at service, I wouldn't have a daily devotional video today because I was planning on having a procedure this morning. Uh, it turns out my doctor got sick, and so uh, my procedure had to be postponed. It's been uh, rescheduled for December 5th, uh, which is more than a month away, uh, just over a month away. And uh, um, not thrilled with that, but... Uh, what can you do, right? Uh, there's situations beyond your control, and uh, nothing is beyond God's control. So you put it in God's hands, and you sort of just let that be. I am delighted, though, to be able to say this morning, happy birthday to Sue Buckley. Sue, happy birthday. We love you so much. We're glad you're part of our fellowship. You're a wonderful lady. Uh, Sue is a, a wonderful teacher, really skilled teacher, loves children, uh, has been part of our children's church ministry, part of our vacation Bible school. Um, she's taught adult Sunday school. She's and right now she's uh, uh, works in our uh, as our care and hospitality uh, um, team leader. So yeah, Sue does a phenomenal amount of stuff in the church, but also she's just a wonderful, sharp, insightful woman. And so Sue, we love you very much. We're glad to have you part of the Bible study on Wednesday nights. And um, yeah, so. Very happy birthday to you. Hope that today you're surrounded by love and you know that you are loved by your family and friends, by your church, and of course, by your Jesus. Uh, yeah, happy birthday. Uh, this, uh, this past Sunday, yesterday, gave one of the toughest sermons of my career, actually. I talked about uh, if, uh, if a baby dies, do they go to heaven, uh, biblically, and then also what specifically about abortion? And so it was a challenging sermon yesterday. Uh, if that topic interests you, check it out uh, at our, uh, at our uh, live stream archive page. Uh, it's there, uh, saved up for you there. It's part of our Ask Me Anything series, a chance for you to ask any question and get a, get a hopefully a good sermon out of it. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, this week, I'm going to be doing uh, the Ask Me Anything uh, sermons for this upcoming Sunday that didn't get picked. Um, for, actually, for last Sunday that didn't get picked. And so the first one that didn't get picked for last Sunday is, can you speak to the omission of Christ's teaching ministry in the Apostles' Creed? How may this omission have influenced Christian life and ministry across the centuries? the omission of Christ's teaching ministry in the Apostles' Creed? I, that's a very interesting question. Um, I hadn't ever thought about it until I saw this, this question. And uh, I hope to give you some good thoughts of, uh, specifically about the heart of your question tomorrow. I think it's important in order for us to, uh, to answer this question in a way that makes any sense, to talk first about what are creeds? Why do we have creeds? What are they? And uh, do we have any examples of them from the Bible? So uh, we're going to talk about that today. Tomorrow we'll talk about this, the, the Apostles' Creed specifically. Um, and then we'll talk about some other creeds as the week goes on. Because um, it's a great subject and I love talking about it. But also, um, but today I want to focus in, zero in on the question of what are creeds. If you grew up in an evangelical church, you might not even uh, know creeds very well, but, uh, but a creed is basically a short um, statement of belief. It's a short statement of belief, typically in a very uh, well-crafted, punchy uh, kind of fashion that's designed to teach, uh, teach, teach uh, doctrine. So a creed is designed to teach specific doctrine. And... Um, We'll get into the Apostles' Creed specifically uh, in tomorrow's devotional video. But I wanted to ask the question, does the Bible contain any creeds? Does it contain any short, punchy statements of belief that are sort of packaged together as a sort of a, a means for teaching doctrine? 
Um, and in fact, it does, and it contains many of them, and I'm only going to touch on a couple of them uh, in today's video. But I want to talk about the first creed that we know about. This is, this is the earliest Christian creed uh, that we know about, and it, it's found here in Romans 10.9. Uh, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, this whole thing is not the creed I'm talking about. The, the, the creed I'm talking about is the phrase, Jesus is Lord. If you confess with your mouth, and the Greek doesn't have the word that, uh, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Jesus is Lord is the earliest known Christian creed. Jesus is Lord. We see it in a bunch of different places in the in the New Testament. It's uh, here's the next uh, place I want to talk about. First Corinthians twelve, verse three. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is Lord is the the the, the central punchy teaching of the first Christian creed. Now, I want to uh, point out why this is so essential. Um, what does Jesus is Lord tell us? Uh, for us, in our day and age, it might not be a, a tremendously, I mean, it's, it's meaningful, um, but it, it seems like sort of a basic statement of belief. But in, in the earliest days of the church, Jesus is Lord was a creed that was uttered in a, in a culture where Caesar is Lord, Caesar, the, the Roman emperor, Caesar is Lord, was the, uh, was the vow or the, the oath that you had to swear in order to be considered a citizen of the Roman Empire, uh, a good citizen of the Roman Empire, a citizen in good standing. You needed to be able to affirm that Caesar is Lord in order to stay in good standing with the Roman Empire. You know, it didn't honestly matter to the Romans what religion you were, as long as you could affirm that Caesar is Lord over all of the religions of the area. Um, you can believe all the beliefs that you want, and then over and above that, Caesar is Lord. So Caesar has the ability to make the rules and to uh, and to and to govern all of the religions uh, of the earth, and so wherever Caesar is reigns, wherever is under whatever is under the Roman Empire, uh, those three words, Caesar is Lord, uh, were the the sort of the the rallying cry. There was it was the it was the the uh, the oath of citizenship that you took to remain a citizen in good standing in the Roman Empire. It was, it was affirming that Caesar was Lord above all other lords. Into this context, the first Christian creed was Jesus is Lord. Uh, notice it's not just a bare statement of belief, but in reality, it is, uh, it's a counterattack. It's a, it's, a, it's a response. It's a, it's a, it's a combative response to the dominant um, oath of the culture. Into a culture where every citizen had to affirm that Caesar was Lord, Christians could not say those three words. Christians instead said, Jesus is Lord. And when you look at Christian history, you see many examples uh, of, uh, of, of non-Christians writing, uh, non-Christian historians writing uh, about the odd behavior of those weirdo Christians, uh, because whereas everybody else was willing to affirm that Caesar was Lord, those simple three words, Christians were not. And so Christians were, uh, at the times of persecution, Christians were led away to execution and given one last chance before they were executed, before they were uh, thrown to the, the, the lions in the Colosseum or before they were uh, lit on fire uh, to be burned at the stake. Um, they were given one last opportunity to just say, Caesar is Lord, and they could step down and they, could not, they would not be killed. But uh, what we find from these uh, non-Christian historians is that they said these strange Christians 
when given the opportunity, don't. Uh, don't uh, swear that Caesar is Lord. In fact, some of the earliest historical documents say, uh, look, if you can get them to say Caesar is Lord, they're not really a Christian. So there's no need to execute them. Uh, Jesus is Lord was sort of the battle cry, uh, the cultural, the, the anti-countercultural battle cry of the Christians of the first century. Um, we see sort of a fuller um, statement of this creed in Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11. And this, as you're reading along in Philippians, this stands out as sort of an elegantly crafted passage. And I think it, it is, again, this is, this is a sort of a fuller creed. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, and here we go with the creed, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being for, born in the likeness of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. It's a wonderful package of belief here, teaching which talks about Jesus uh, as God come in the flesh, taking the form of a servant, so that, and, and then being exalted, having, having been uh, sort of com coming down into the form of a servant, then uh, being obedient to the point of death, humbled even to the death of a, on a cross, and then highly exalted, bestowed the name that's above every name, so that at his name, every knee in heaven and on earth would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Christian teaching in the earliest days was this, this beautiful trajectory of Jesus coming down uh, from being God on high, uh, um, incarnate in the flesh, uh, serving, being a serve, humbled as a servant, uh, suffering death, even death on the cross, and then God highly exalted him, this downward trajectory and an upward trajectory to the point at which every tongue on earth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This, the Christian belief, even while, they're being, uh, even while they were a small, tiny uh, minority within the Roman Empire, even when they were persecuted among the Roman Empire, the earliest Christian belief was that every tongue would one day confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and not Caesar. And so if you go to your death proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, uh, you are a, a forerunner of what everybody ultimately is going to have to confess. So why confess that Caesar is Lord when that's a belief that is, is going to go down the drain uh, and not be a, a, a worthwhile belief much longer? Um, it, Jesus is Lord was a creed that gave the Christians strength. Jesus is Lord was a creed that gave the Christians a rallying cry. Jesus is Lord was the central defining kernel around them, which the dominant battle of the, of the, of the age was being fought. And that's what creeds are for. I want to say, I want to say that in more detail tomorrow, but that's what creeds are for. Creeds are not just statements of belief. Creeds are statements of belief into a particular time and place to make the points that are necessary to give Christians the, the, uh, the, the wherewithal to withstand the dominant uh, um, gale force winds uh, of the era. We'll talk more about that tomorrow, but I hope that this review of Jesus is Lord has given you uh, the wherewithal that you need for today's battle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we are so grateful to be servants of Jesus as our Lord. And we pray that I pray today that this uh, creed would put steel in our spines, that we would know that you are God and you are Lord. Lord, I thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful truth. I pray today for Sue Buckley on her birthday. Please bless her, help her to know that she is loved by the Lord of the universe and she is precious to you. Uh, please bless her in every way. Lord, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, what is the sermon for this upcoming Sunday? Um, here, the votes are in, and actually it was very close, but just by a small margin, this was the, this was the uh, topic that was chosen. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, if you, believe what you, if you believe what you ask for in prayer, you've received it. So why do we need to keep praying for the same thing over and over again? Good question, and that'll be the topic for the sermon this Sunday. I hope that you uh, are interested. I'm interested in this topic. It's an important topic because we are people supposed to be people of prayer, and this is going to help us um, to understand what prayer is, why we pray, uh, and how prayer works. Very challenging subject. I hope that you'll uh, come this Sunday or tune in on our live stream this Sunday. All right. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for this daily update and devotional video. I love you, New Beginnings, and I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow.